super fun. Um, Krista, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to turn things over to you. And if you give me just one second, I will, while you're talking, I'll get the slideshow set up. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming today. Um, like I said, um, like Brenda said, I'm from Legal Aid Service in Northeastern Minnesota. You'll see my title slide in a minute. We're going to be talking about one, a topic that's uh, close to my heart. I work with it every day, medical assistance. Um, and I'll talk more, a lot about that today. And we'll see, there's a lot to know and we won't cover everything, but I want you to know that we're here to help answer questions if you have them afterwards or you come across some questions as you go forward in life when life events happen, we're here to help. So please, please reach out. So that's my opening slide. So we're gonna be talking about spending down to public programs, medical assistance. So we can go to the next one. So here is our contact information. Uh, the number on the left is our intake line. And um, you can see we're a nonprofit law firm and we cover the 11 counties in Northeastern Minnesota. Um, and you can see that we have a lot of land. I just want to point out that that surface area of that land is about 28,000 square miles. It's about the size of Ireland. We got five offices, um, Duluth, Grand Rapids, um, Brainerd, Pine City, and Virginia. And we have about 30 people that work at Legal Aid. We don't charge anything. What we do is we want to provide uh, legal advice and representation in civil matters to as many people as we can, although we do have to have some income and asset uh, guidelines for uh, applicants who call us. But if you are 60 or older, we have a pot of funding that means that we don't have to focus on income and asset uh, guidelines as much. In fact, if you're 60 and older and you uh, live in our service area, and you have something that's uh, something we can help with, we're gonna try to help you as much as we can, regardless of your income or asset. But it has to be civil law. We don't do any criminal law. That's what the public defender's office does. Any questions, well, any questions, feel free to ask them as we go. But well, let's head on into the topic. Next slide, please. So I'm going to move something over here on my screen. So this is today's agenda. We're going to be talking about medical assistance for long-term care. Um, and I like to look at medical assistance as a framework of, of um, the beginning of medical assistance, which is eligibility, and then at the end, what could happen about recovering those benefits. But today we're going to talk about what it is and what it's not, and then launch into eligibility, and then talk about just shortly how it works when you're on medical assistance. And then of course, benefit recovery, state recovery, medical assistance needs, things of that nature. Um, today, it's mostly geared for anybody in the public to learn about, but I note that there's some experts on the line as well. And if you have any points you'd like to raise, feel free to, to raise them um, more. Heads are better than one, I think, when it comes to medical assistance. Why don't we, Kristen, take a second, and mm -hmm. I'm just going to launch a quick poll. Sure. So you pop up on your screen. Um, just inquiring as to what folks' background is, so we do have an idea of, as, as you're presenting, whether we're talking to folks who are aging service providers, community members, um, or volunteers with an organization. All right. Oh, we've got folks filtering in as we're as we're as we're doing the poll. Take this one more second. Let's 
So it looks like most folks are either in aging services or human service professionals, but we do have about a third of the folks who are community members as well. So stop sharing that and I will turn it back over to you. Well, that's great. Um, so if you work with folks in the community, feel free to, to bring this information to them that, that you see after this and give them our contact information. Um, we say this is one of our main uh, advice areas and representation areas for our older clients who come in. I don't know if we can talk about that more as we go. So let's go to the next slide. So why is it important to know about medical assistance? To me, knowledge is power. And medical assistance is something foggy that you don't really know about unless you're thrown into it. And that's never a comfortable place to be, uh, facing it in, in a crisis situation. So if uh, you know about it beforehand, you can kind of keep in the back of your mind the general aspects of it so you know how it's supposed to go and maybe avoid some pitfalls on the front end so you don't run into problems later. Um, you also have more options for planning if you know more about it now. Probably better to know your options early so then you can choose, choose different plans in life. So let's go to the next slide. Alrighty, what is medical assistance? Well, most of the rest of the country calls it Medicaid. It's the same thing. If you're gonna to go to a federal website to talk about it, it's uh, called Medicaid. Don't get confused, this is absolutely the same thing. So let's go to the next slide. And this one's gonna blow your mind. So I stole this slide. It's from uh, another presentation that some elder law attorneys did about medical assistance. And they used this slide to show about all the moving parts that could come up in their medical assistance practice. This happened to be in New York State. Um, but a lot of this is the same. So you can see that your head can start to spin when you're talking about medical assistance. And it really truly takes a few years after, until you get the hang of it when you're working with it as a professional. So do not feel bad at all if your head is spinning at the end of the, of the session today. There's a lot of moving parts. I tried to not overwhelm the slides, so that's why I picked a more streamlined slide. This is the most busy slide we're gonna have. And we're not gonna, it's not gonna look like this. So this is what, if you go to an elder law attorney, this is some of the things that we're gonna be thinking about as we have conversations. Let's go to the next one. So the basics, medical assistance. So Congress created it in 1965, part of the Great Society Movement. Um, it falls under Title 14 of the Social Security Act. If you're going to look for that, that's the citation there. Um, it was created in order to help people meet their medical costs um, when they have limited income or resources. Uh, Medicare doesn't cover everything. And we'll see that later on, what it doesn't, doesn't cover. Um, I already said that it's called medical assistance in Minnesota. For shorthand, I'm gonna call it MA. We can move on to the next. So it is a hybrid program. It's a hybrid of two parts, federal and state government. So right away, you can see where things can get complicated. Um, the way it works is managed by the County Social Services Department. So the state is involved in that way, but the state is also involved in setting some of the rules and getting permission for those rules from the, from the federal government. Um, MA is the largest public or private health insurance, which is surprising because you don't really hear about it too much unless you're You've got friends, family who are using it, um, but it's the biggest one. And it covers healthcare for lots of different people, as you can see here, under 25, 65 or older, parents, caregivers, children, pregnant women, and people who are blind or disabled. 
And I see if there's a question here. Nope, not yet. Um, next slide, please. So you might have might hear in the news where states choose not to um, take part in Medicaid expansion. Um, states aren't required to participate, but for medical assistance, long-term care, all of the states participate. And I think it was in 1982 when everybody started to participate. But as I said, each state could have different details and you have to be careful. For example, Minnesota's medical assistance is not identical to Wisconsin. Uh, we're not identical to the Dakotas. Everybody's gonna be different, even though the bones are gonna be the same because it's a federal program, but that state part will make some differences. Um, everybody, though all states will have to follow the Social Security Act, that's the federal part. And when you talk about assets and income, when the, the county evaluates those things, that's done under the SSI um, method. So that's the supplemental security income. And for those practitioners out there, you can get those under the POMS, we call that, under Social Security uh, website. It's called Program Operations Manual. So that's a good thing to go to if you wanted to get some uh, basics about that rather than going into the US code, which can be kind of clunky. Not to say that POMS isn't clunky, but it's a little bit better or different. Um, so the way it works is the federal government sets the main rules. And if your state wants to try something different, they ask for special permission to change those details on some things. So we can go to the next one. Yes. Just a little factoid about medical assistance. So for older adults, medical assistance, um, older adults comprise about a third of all MA spending. And the figure from 2018, as you can see there, is 197 billion. It's so important for a lot of people. Um, it pays for about half of long-term care services. And long-term care services can be in the home, in the community, we call it, or in a nursing home. If you are in a nursing home, medical assistance has to cover long-term care for those that are eligible. Um, but some states, home and community-based services are optional. Minnesota, we have the elderly waiver program. And in the papers you get from the county, it's abbreviated as M-A-E-W. I'm just gonna check the chat to see if there's any questions. Nope, not so far. We're blazing through the basics, which is good because we've got other things to talk about. We got examples and things like that. Let's go to the next slide and talk about medical assistance and Medicare. So a lot of times when people uh, come to me, they may be confused about Medicare. Um, it's not the same thing as medical assistance. So what Medicare does, it pays for doctor hospitalizations, prescriptions. You've heard of part A, part B, part D, those things. So that's like a health insurance policy, if you wanna think about it like that, it pays for those services under the policy terms. There's a medical assistance program that is similar to that. Um, it's more like a healthcare policy. Um, think of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare health insurance. Uh, we're not gonna be talking about that today. Today, we're gonna to be talking about medical assistance for long-term care. That's the type of Medicare that actually pays for services that you get in your home, uh, whether you live in a nursing home or in your home. So it's, uh, it's not the same thing. So that's why when you see it, it's gonna have MA-LTC. So different program, different part of the program, different rules. Go to the next slide. So it's all about long-term care. So long-term care, you might be asking, what the heck is long-term care? So long-term care is care that helps you stay independent. It helps you um, get services to deal with activities, daily living. 
it's we call it custodial care. It's so you so you can take care of your daily life. It's not acute care. Medicare pays for uh, mainly for acute care, and it's when you um, need to go to the doctor for a problem, you need some uh, medication, or you need rehabilitation, as we'll see in the next slide. It pays for a part of that. Um, so medical assistance and Medicare works together, um, though, and that's why it can be confusing. So I wanted to just show in the next slide a, an example of how it works. So the example we're going to use is somebody who experiences a stroke and is brought to the nursing home. But it would this example later on will also work for other things, like if you're at home and you needed services in the home. So this is this is the example. So as you can see on the left side of your screen, you have an emergency. The ambulance brings you to the emergency room because you're experiencing a stroke. So that is acute care. They got to figure it out and get you stabilized. So Medicare pays for that. If you're in the um, emergency room and then you go, you're there for long enough, either in the emergency room or the hospital for three qualifying days, then Medicare is going to pay. So every time you do that, you have what's known as a spell of illness block of days that Medicare could pay up to, and it can go up to 100 days called the 100 day spell of illness. So Medicare will then pay for it as long as you're getting skilled care, which means that you, you need care that's keeping you uh, from getting worse or you're, um, you need monitoring, physical therapy, those sorts of things. So you can get that in the hospital or in the nursing home under rehabilitation. You can see that typically you go to the hospital, they're not gonna wanna keep you there long so they're gonna transfer you to the nursing home and then you can get rehabilitation. Um, skilled care has a specific definition under Medicare. So if you think that Medicare has stopped too soon because skilled care is no longer given, you can appeal that to Medicare, but you have to do it fast. So just a plug right now, if you think you should still uh, be on Medicare, appeal that right away, you should get a notice, call the number. It goes very fast. Um, to figure out that, that appeal. Um, so if the nursing home determines that you no longer need skilled care, Medicare is gonna stop, even if you're not at the 100 days. So it could be at, you're at the 16th day or the 30th day. Medicare stops, uh, skilled care stops, Medicare stops. Um, before we go on, to the, uh, what happens at that point, I just want to point out that Medicare will pay in full for the first 20 days and partially for the 21st through 100 days or whenever Medicare stopped. Um, during that partial payment period, you could have a supplemental health insurance policy that could cover that gap. If you don't, then you're going to get a bill for that. Um, so let's go to once Medicare stops, then what happens? Let's say you're still in the nursing home, you're on rehab, you're getting custodial care at this point. It's not acute care. So you're getting care for your activities of daily living. So if you're not ready to go home yet and you still need that care, you're gonna either have to apply for medical assistance to pay for it or pay for it privately. Same thing if you were at home. If you're at home and you needed services, you got a diagnosis um, for a condition and you needed to get in homemaker services or PCA or some other services, then you would uh, do the same thing. You could apply for medical assistance if you can't afford to pay it. Once you're home for 60 days, just to wrap up this example, if you're home for 60 days and then have another acute care need, that restarts another 100 day spell of illness. If you happen to fall again or something, fall before your 60 days is up, then you use up the rest of that 100 day that wasn't used up before. So I know that's a big example. So there might be some questions there. Sorry, my cat just 
knocked over something. So if there, anybody has any questions, I'd take any right now um, before we move on. I don't want to overwhelm people as we go. So that's just Medicare, but different than medical assistance. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you, Brenda. So as you can see, I put this slide in here just to underline the fact that we're not talking about the healthcare policy type of medical assistance, because that's not long-term care medical assistance. We're gonna be talking about getting medical assistance in your home or in a nursing home. And in your home, it could be in your house, in an apartment, in assisted living, uh, anything that's not a nursing home. In the, if you're in, getting in your home, it's called wavered services. For older folks, specifically, it's called elderly waiver. And like I said, it covers the types of services you need in order to be independent. Uh, just a note about uh, names. In the rules, you'll see nursing homes called skilled nursing facilities. I like to use nursing home because that's what people call them. Um, but just don't be don't be surprised if you see that term used instead of nursing home. It's the same thing. All right, next slide. So here we get to the meat of it: eligibility for medical assistance. We're going to talk about the basics. We're going to talk about spend down when that happens and how to do it safely so you don't go um, become ineligible because of something that you may have done and some tips along the way. But feel free to ask questions as we go. So when we when I speak with a client about planning, if they're calling me ahead of time when nobody has any crisis at the moment, I like to frame it. Well, I like to frame it for any client. You have to think about medical assistance on the front end with eligibility, and then at the back end for the state recovery and medical assistance needs. Those are totally separate rules. What, what's important with eligibility on the front end is not gonna be important later on. A lot of people are, are worried about recovery. Um, my, if, my opinion about it is if you need the long-term care and you can't afford to do it, I think you should get the medical assistance and uh, worry about recovery later. Um, people are worried about providing uh, a legacy for family members, um, but in my opinion, they probably would prefer you have to be happy and healthy for as long as possible rather than and get medical assistance in order to do that, rather than not get medical assistance and, and not be able to be healthy and stay at home. My two cents. So we can go to the next slide. So who is eligible for medical assistance? So these are the main points of being eligible. First of all, you have to live in Minnesota. You have to be a US citizen or a qualifying non-citizen. And you have to meet a category of eligibility. Uh, here we're going to talk about being 65 or older, or blind or disabled. So those are the those are the basis that my clients become eligible. But there are other categories as well, such as um, pregnant women, children, um, uh, those sorts of things. You have to also meet financial guidelines. So you have to be at or under the income and asset limit. Um, so the basic asset limit for an individual is $3,000 in countable assets. The income is different depending on how many people in your household. Um, another big thing to remember, you have to need services when you apply. So that's why you get screened before you can get medical assistance, you have to be able to have enough need. And then of course you have to complete the application and do all the verifications that the county wants you to do. So those things 
if they apply to you, then you're eligible and you can apply. Now that doesn't mean you have to apply. Like I said before, some people choose not to do it. Um, some people um, don't want it yet. Maybe they have enough, sort of enough need for it, but maybe they're getting by with just a little extra help from family members for the time being. That's okay too. Nobody's going to force you to apply for medical assistance. You should say that depends. Well, I'm just envisioning a situation where somebody maybe really needs it and is living at home. And if somebody thinks you need it, anybody can file for guardianship. And if they get guardianship, then they can apply for medical assistance against your will. So there's all different things in the world that could happen, but that's very, very rare. All righty, let's go to the next slide. So here is a slide about the main things that can go wrong. I call it the eligibility obstacle course. So you're on top, you're applying. So these are the main ways that you wanna look for problems. So here's a question before we get in, is this only for Minnesota people? Uh, this, this is geared for Minnesota people. The main, if you're thinking about other states, you're still going to find some value in this presentation. But I, any figures that are used and uh, rules, you want to double check with the equivalent person in your state. Uh, for example, the Older Americans Act funds senior law projects in every state. So you could call... Um, 211 or United Way or the senior linkage line to find out or us to find out who is the equivalent legal aid in your area to find out this information. But you can also go online to find it as well. The um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services would have some good basic federal information and probably have some links to other states too. Your local state Department of Human Services will also have some information, but good question. Alrighty, so obstacles. This is what the county's, any to, anything that the county is gonna look at in your application for eligibility, it's a potential for a problem. For example, they're gonna look at income. And if you have more, more income than you should, there'll have to be a spend down. That's not necessarily a huge problem if you've got uh, things you need to spend down on for medical services. Um, they're gonna look at assets, how much you have in countable assets. And we're gonna get into what's countable or not in a little bit. Um, but a lot of times people run into problems if they've given gifts in the past and there's a look back period. So the look back period is 60 months. I like to say five years and one month. So the one month is the month of application. So when you apply for medical assistance, the county is gonna look back five years and one month for any gifts that you made. Um, technically, they count any gifts of any size and then they add them all up and then they figure out how long that's gonna cause ineligibility. We'll talk about that more in a later slide. But that's a, a main problem. And we'll talk about what to do if you get denied for that. Another problem could be that you have too many assets. Maybe you didn't give any away, you didn't spend any on, your, on yourself and just have too much. So that means that you're not eligible and you won't be eligible until you spend it down. So then get spend down carefully so you don't wind up in the other box where you get the penalties for the gifts. Um, for naming uh, conventions, the county uses the term uncompensated transfers, but that really just means gifts. Anytime that you're not getting fair value for your asset or money. So let's go to the next slide. So if you hit any problems and you think that the county did something wrong, either that they did an action wrong or they didn't do something that you think they should have done, you have a right to appeal it. And this is how you do it in the main, the main points. So you wanna appeal it right away. And the reason why you do that is to protect your right to a hearing. The deadline to appeal is 
30 days. If you are somebody who is already on medical assistance and you got a notice saying that it's terminated or there's a problem, um, if you appeal it within 10 days, you can continue those benefits while the appeal is pending. So don't sit on anything that you get. So if you get a denial or a termination notice, please contact us or contact your uh, county and appeal it. Because you're not out anything in appealing it. It just safeguards your right to have a hearing. If you miss those deadlines, you really have to have good cause to miss them. And that's not a, that has a limit on it as well. So appeal it. And then if you find out later that you don't have a good basis for appealing, you can always withdraw it. There's no penalty for appealing and then withdrawing. When you uh, appeal it, the county is going to send you something called the state agency appeal summary. That's all the reasons why they did what they did. If they denied it, your application, they're going to say why. So that's how that's what you use to prepare for your appeal and to determine whether or not you don't have any basis. Um, the, you can appeal in writing, but you can do it to the, either the county social service department or directly to the state. I like to do it to the county because sometimes you can work things out without having to have a hearing. If you contact the state right away, it's going to set the wheels in motion to get the hearing scheduled. But if you think that something can just an easy problem to fix, the county social service department is a good place to start, especially if you already have a relationship with them. It's not going to cost you anything to appeal free of charge. Um, the county doesn't charge you. The state doesn't charge you. You do get the state agency a summary, but that's, in my opinion, not enough. You should ask for your file. And that includes the notes from the county and their emails, which can have very useful things in it. So, it just don't, so when you ask for your file, ask for those things as well. You have a right to it. And I think that there was a question here. Well, it looks like a, a nice big question. Um, so I'm gonna read it just quickly. Looks like this has a, the question is talking about uh, asset transfers and um, maybe some improper transfers by a, another person, maybe somebody was misusing a power of attorney. That's all, there's a lot of things going on in that question. Let's see. Some of it was spent down before the five year look back, some during, or the assets treated when you apply, do they separate? Assets owned by different people. Okay, so let me, let me talk about what happens if you if you give gifts before the look back period of five years and one month, it's as if it does, they don't exist, the county. So the county is not even going to consider anything to do with those gifts. It's no problem whatsoever for eligibility. For those gifts made during the look back period, that's the problem. That's gonna be causing some ineligibility. And they, they don't care who owns them at this point. All they care about is who, were they the applicants during the look back period and did they get out of that applicant's hand? It doesn't matter if another person did that for the applicant through a power of attorney. If there was no fair value for it, that's gonna be a gift and it's gonna be looked at. Um, so I hope that answered the question. As far as mismanagement, um, the applicant could have, um, against the power of attorney for any financial abuse or exploitation. Um, but that's a separate thing from medical assistance eligibility. Um, and then what should happen if they get denied, they should appeal it and then um, look for any exceptions to the gifting rule and make the argument that with dementia, they didn't have the intent to make gifts. And if all else fails, ask for a hardship waiver. We'll talk about that. 
So let's go to the next slide. Good question, by the way. Wow. Oh, before we get, get to there, another question. How does the county do a look back? Very good question. So when you apply, you fill out this application and it has a lot of questions on it. And it asks you what you own, what your income is. And the question will be, have you given away or transferred any asset within the last 60 months? And then you have to list them. Um, some people might say, well, why don't you just not list them? Some people say, well, I could hide things in the backyard. Don't do that um, because what the county the application also does is you will sign it and you sign it saying that everything on the application is true to the best of your knowledge. And if later they prove that you hidden something, they're going to say, well, for a fraud, which is somewhere you don't want to go because there's other things that they can try to get, claw that benefit back from you and maybe refer it to um, prosecution in the worst case scenario. So they also, when you sign it, you give them permission to verify what you own. And part of that is that they can, you give them permission to see your bank statements, for example, so they can see transfers. They can see things that's happened in the look back period. So my policy is disclose everything. If it's a problem, you know, we can deal with it. If not, at least the application period has started and that starts the clock running on the ineligibility period. And then maybe some other way you could finance your long-term care if you couldn't get a hardship waiver. So it's always better to disclose it. So that's how look back periods work. It's just, you're telling them, they're verifying what you tell them with looking at your staff. So let's see, any other questions on that one? But that's a great one. Um, so let's talk about income eligibility. So income eligibility is based on gross income. So what you do is you report your gross income and when you look at the manual online, if you choose to do so, which I have the link for at the end, the eligibility programs manual, it's under the method B. So there's two methods, A and B. So don't bother reading method A, it's just a waste of time. Go directly to method B in the different rules. Um, so they count gross income and then they do a bunch of different steps to figure out what your net income is. So some things aren't gonna be counted. So you're gonna list all your income. Um, there's a list of things that are excluded, uh, like um, benefits if you were, uh, some settlement benefits. I've got a list here, I won't bore you with it. So if, it fall, if that income falls under that certain list, it's not counted, so it's just like set aside, it doesn't exist in determining eligibility. Then they look to see if any of the other income is unavailable, for example, you can't get at it. If you can't get at the income, it's unavailable, it's not gonna be counted. And then they look at another list to see if it's specified as income that's not counted. So there's excluded income, unavailable income, and not counted income. So from those laundry lists, if your income falls under those things, it's set aside and not even looked at. What's left then, they, then the county subtracts certain things. They call them disregards and deductibles, like a $20 disregard, things like that. And then the result is the net countable income, which is what they then compare to the eligibility guidelines to see if you're eligible. And I see a question here. Husband and wife scenario for income Husband has income, wife does not, but wife needs the medical assistance. So that's a very good question. So it will depend on the type of medical assistance. Wavered, even wavered elderly waiver, they look at both income. If you're in the nursing home, um, the community spouse gets to keep all their own income. You're supposed to be able to keep all your own income too with elderly waiver but in determining where you fall in the elderly waiver, they're gonna consider what your income is in determining eligibility. 
But once you're on L, we waiver the community spouse gets to keep all her own income, or this would be his income. So just a little bit naming. Uh, so the spouse that needs the medical assistance, you could call them the medical MA spouse or the institutionalized spouse. The spouse that does not need medical assistance is the community spouse. So community spouse always keeps their own income. And we'll see that as we go along. But um, medical assistance will consider both incomes in determining um, eligibility. So we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you for the question. So income limit again. So like I said, there's two main programs for long-term care, nursing home, elderly waiver in the home. So the way it works is when you're on in the nursing home on medical assistance, the institutionalized person income goes for the cost of care, but some things are going to be allowed to go other places. Uh, for example, they get to have what's known as a monthly personal needs allowance, which now is $105 per month. Uh, but going to the other example of a married couple, if the community spouse, they keep their, all their own income, but if they don't have enough money, they can get some money from the institutionalized spouse. It's called an allocation to bring them up to a minimum amount if there's enough to go, get, go around. So that's another way the institutionalized spouse's money can go to somewhat something other than the cost of care, but mainly it goes towards the cost of care. We can think of that as a cost sharing method. Um, so that is the easy way to think about medical assistance, nursing home, it's easier rules. Other the waiver, it's more complicated. So the problem is, Twofold. You might have too much income, so then you'll have a income spend down, which acts like an insurance deductible. But um, they need you need to spend that on certain things, so you just can't spend it down on anything that you want. And you might not have enough need to spend it on, so that's a problem. If you can't do the income spend down, you can't get the elderly waiver. Um, Another problem that I see though, is when you have a community spouse living in the homestead and the uh, MA spouse lives in assisted living, for example, there sometimes is not enough money to go around from both their incomes. I know I just said the community spouse gets to keep all their own income, but sometimes that's not enough to pay the bills to sustain the homestead. Um, when they were living together, it's no problem, but when they're not, the MA spouse's income is already spoken for unless there's enough to do that spousal allocation. Um, I want to see if I, I've got an example later on that I can do. But the minimum that the rules say that you could get is $2,178 from the other, the medical assistant spouse. Most people aren't going to have that. So um, if the community spouse has zero income, which is weird, because I'd be doing a benefits review with Social Security at that point, but let's say that she's got zero income in the community, then my spouse has um, $1,000 of income. They're going to keep the $105, probably going to keep enough for Medicare premiums. And then they're gonna look at the rest as an allocation to the spouse. So that will bring her up to probably about $750, $800. So if he had more income, she could get more. I hope that's understandable. The, the rules don't want to impoverish community spouses. They want them to be able to stay home. If Let's go to the next slide, unless there's another question. Oh, here's a question. Um, moms in assisted living on MA qualified for renter's credit this year. Is that income? Well, gosh, I, it's unless it's an exempt. My mind is blanking. I don't want to say either way, 
but income that you money that you get in the month that you get it is income if you keep it over that month it's asset so it could become a problem for assets as eligibility as well i just don't re remember if renters credit is exempt or not if anybody who works in the trade knows feel free to pop it in the chat but good question Let's see, let's go to the next slide. And if you wanted to contact me later, my email is on, on the, one of the last slides. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Good question, by the way. Let's see. The next slide, Brenda is okay. so let's talk about assets so minnesota has two asset limits if you're a married couple you add them together as a single person you can keep three thousand dollars in countable assets um, for the community spouse you can see you can keep a pretty large number one hundred and thirty thousand three hundred and eighty dollars the idea is that the rules don't want to impoverish community spouses. You want to be able to live in the community because that's better for everybody. Um, however, for determining eligibility, the assets are gonna be counted individually and jointly. So it doesn't work to protect anything by having them in the different spouses' names. It just really doesn't matter when you're doing eligibility. You just add up everything that they own and then, um, you determine if some of those things are not counted or not. For example, some things aren't counted. Your homestead's not counted as long as you're living there or another protected person is living there, uh, like a child, disabled child or a underage child. Those people are living there, it's protected. If you have um, anything owned with another person that becomes unavailable, so that's not counted. One vehicle is not counted, burial, plant, burial plans with space items in them are not counted. So there's different things that are not counted. So it's similar to assets or income in that way. Some things are counted and some are not. So once you set aside those things that are counted, then you add up the countable income. Altogether, if they're over $133,380, then there's gonna have to be an asset spend down. So that's how you figure out if you're eligible as a couple for medical assistance, even if only one couple needs medical assistance. If both need medical assistance, then of course the asset limit is going to be $6,000 total. So that's a lot um, on this slide. I should say for those assets that are owned with a third party, the county is gonna take a closer look at those to see when that third party got that asset to see if there's any gift problem um, because they wanna make sure that you, if it's within the look back period, they wanna make sure that you got fair value for whatever that third party's interest is. If it's beyond that, you know, look back place 10 years ago when you named a child onto a deed, for example, no problem, doesn't affect eligibility. But let's say that it, you added your child during the look back period, they're gonna take a look at that and they're gonna ask some questions. They're gonna say, did that child pay you for it? Uh, if if uh, they're paying you as a loan, they wanna see loan papers. So if that's something that you're going to do, you wanna make sure you go to somebody who could help you make sure that it looks like an arm's length loan so you don't get dinged by the gift penalty. So uh, let me see if there's a question. Oh, if an adult child is taking care of a parent, do they count the adult child's income too? No. I don't know if somebody's alarm is going off. It's not mine. Do you want to check that or mute your alarm? Thanks. Uh, but an adult child's income who is taking care of them, I do not count that income. or their assets or caregivers. Um, 
you should take that back. Caveat is if they live there, so that they, for income, they very well may consider that. You can see where medical assistance is tricky. Assets, they're not gonna count if you're a caregiver and you don't live there. And they're not gonna count your income if you don't live there. Um, assisted living cost, another question, cost $5,000 per month, but the in but income is 580 per month, no assets or other income. So I may pay the gap or is there a limit to what MA pays? The difference between. So assisted living is tricky. And not only that, uh, assisted living does not have to accept medical assistance. They do have to tell you up front, though, if they don't uh, take medical assistance. Sometimes they have a waiting period where you have to pay full price for assisted living costs until the waiting period is over, say two years. And then you could have medical assistance if you're eligible at that time to pay for services. It does not pay for room and board. Uh, so you have to be able to sure, be sure to have money for that. If you don't, then you could possibly get housing supports from the county, which is a different program. Uh, it used to be called GRH, or Group Residential Housing. So there's ways to have assisted living paid for, um, but the assisted living will likely transfer you to a lower cost unit um, because they don't want you to have a, a fancier unit and get paid a set price from medical assistance because they have contracts with the county to pay a certain amount. That's a good question. Um, so, so Tira, contact me after and I can talk to you more detail about, about the income question. All good questions, keep them coming. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So homesteads, everybody is worried that they're gonna lose their house if somebody goes on to medical assistance, um, especially married people. Um, I call that a forced sale. Since long as somebody is living there that is a protected person, there is no forced sale. So if you have a community spouse there, it's not gonna be counted for your eligibility. So the problem happens, the forced sale happens is when the homestead is counted. Under medical assistance, there's going to be uh, a window, a buffer time of six months of long-term care before they request that you put it up for sale. Um, so for example, if you are living in your home alone, you're the sole owner, there's no protected person, and you get a diagnosis that you, and you just, and you're, condition progresses so you just can't live at home anymore and you have to move out. And then after six months of long-term care in any setting, the county is going to request that you put it up for sale in order to get MA, or if you're already getting it, to keep getting it. So that's what's called a forced sale. Um, but you get to keep the, so the sale proceeds. The county does not get the sale proceeds. What happens is the, the proceeds kick you above the asset limit. So if you're a single person, $3,000, you get the sale proceeds, you're way over 3,000. So you're gonna be privately paying for your cost of care until you get closer to the $3,000 amount before you apply, reapply for medical assistance. Um, so the county doesn't get the house, but they're going to make you use the house asset in order and liquidate it in order to pay for your care if certain such conditions exist. Um, sometimes you can plan ahead and set your house up to avoid this by adding a third person on it. Uh, you can think joint tenancy, life estate, or maybe even certain trusts, but that's tricky as well. Um, a lot of people do a life estate. Um, whenever there's a third party on an asset, the county can't force the sale. They're gonna take a close look. So if that person was added during the look back period, they're gonna to wanna to know, did you get fair value for it? If you did, no problem. In other words, if that child paid you for it. If they didn't, and most often they don't because children don't have the money. Um, 
they're going to uh, ask that that interest is given back to you in order to erase the gift. Um, hopefully the value of the property has stayed the same um, or increased. So then there's not a problem with money still being owed after the gift is transferred back, but that's a problem with real estate. So you have to keep that in mind. Well, values could change over time. Um, so, but let's say another problem pops up. Let's say the child doesn't want to give it back or there's some other reason why the child can't. Let's say the child's incapacitated. Uh, there's no guardianship and things like that. So, let's say for some reason, the child doesn't give it back. Maybe a child says, this is the family farm. Mom wanted to do this. I'm not going to give it back. So what happens? So what happens is, is that medical assistance is going to say that they have a right under state law to go after the child for the Medicare Oh, for the medical assistance uh, costs of providing them under a hardship waiver. So if if you if mom needs the medical assistance and her health is at risk, there's imminent health risk to her, she can ask for a hardship waiver. So if the county approves, they'll provide the medical assistance, but then they're going to go after the child. Now here's where it gets interesting. So remember in the beginning. In the basic section, I talked about medical assistance is a combo of federal law and state law. So federal law really doesn't give the state the right to do that. So there has been a case down in southern Minnesota just in the scenario where the where the child says, nope, this is what mom wants, the farm, keep it in the family, I'm not giving it back. So they dug in their heels, the state went after them in district court, sued them and lost um, because the child argued that the federal law preempts state law because it doesn't say anything about this collection right. So the district court agreed and the child won. But the tricky part is, is that the, how the state didn't appeal it to the Minnesota appellate court. So we don't know how it would play out in other, count, other districts. So it's an indication that it might happen the same way, but it's never a certain thing. So it's not a comfortable position to be in if for a child. So if you think you're going to need long-term care within five years in one month, you wanna keep that in mind. You wanna to look to see if you have other ways to finance your long-term care during that time period. And we're not even gonna talk about long-term care insurance because that might be a good option if you have it, but maybe there's other assets or other ways to pay if that's if that's the concern if you want to keep it in the family versus erasing the gift or roll the dice and see what happens in the district court near you we just don't know um any questions about that it's me any right now but if you think of any please feel free to ask so let's move on to an example, another example. So this is just a basic excess assets example. So let's say you're married, counted up all the countable assets, bank accounts, CDs, uh, cash surrender values of life insurance, uh, the second car, um, maybe a cabin, all those things added up. Well, there would be more than that, but let's just say it's not they got a tiny piece of hunting land. It's all adds up to $160,000. Uh, one spouse needs medical assistance, are they eligible? So as we saw before, as a married couple, you can keep $133,380 in countable assets. So you subtract that from what their total countable assets are to figure out what their excess assets are that they need to spend down. And here we have, 160,000 minus the 133,380, you get $26,620 of excess assets. So right now they are not eligible. Um, so they'd have to spend it down. So how do you do that? Um, if the spouse needs services, you can privately pay for them. In fact, that's one of the main things you're gonna spend on 
is to pay for the cost of care while you're spending it down to the eligibility limit of 133,380. It's not gonna take that long. Um, if you, uh, you could, if you wanted to get a different car, sell the old one, get a new one, you could get a burial plan. You can buy an immediate annuity if you had a large amount that you needed to, to um, spend down on. These are, this is for an immediate annuity for the community spouse. This is tricky, so you have to go to an uh, expert to help you with that. Um, you could spend on funeral or furniture, um, repairs to the house, anything that you want or need that you get fair value for. You could spend it on going to a uh, elder law attorney to get your other documents you may want to have, power of attorney, healthcare directive, will, anything. Fair value to you is, is good. Um, question, what counts as assets? So assets are things that you own, either individually or together with a spouse if you happen to be married. So those are things that you own, you control them, you can, you can cash them out if you wanted to, you can sell them if you wanted to, those are assets. They can be physical things, they can be financial things like money in the bank, they can be things that have value, stocks, bonds, life insurance, cash value, those sorts of things. Anything that you own is value that you can manipulate. Um, those are countable assets. Some assets you can't manipulate, they're unavailable to you, those aren't counted. So good question. Let's move on to the next slide. Alrighty, so this example is like the one I talked about before. A community spouse lives in the homestead and the medical assistance spouse does not. And back at home, the community spouse just doesn't have a lot of money. So in this example, the medical assistance spouse safe in assisted living or in the nursing home has $2,200 a month of income back at home community spouse is $900 a month. And the cost for the home is $1,200 a month. For example, electric and fuel oil insurance, those sorts of things. So it's more than what the community spouse can pay with her income and still have money to buy groceries and other things that she may need. So the rules allow the MA spouse to allocate income to the community spouse. And the rules say the minimum that she could get from some from the spouse is two thousand one hundred seventy eight. The maximum is three thousand two hundred fifty nine dollars and fifty cents. So that's is that's if you had some specialized home expenses. But everybody, all community spouses who don't have enough, can take from their spouse to get to that minimum if there's enough to go around. So in he, this example. Um, the way to figure it out is you take the minimum that she can have, the 2,178 minus 900, and that comes up with how much the medical expense spouse could give her from his income. Here it's 1,278. But then you gotta also let him have the personal needs allowance and Medicare premiums. So it's going to be more around maybe $1,000 or so that she can have. So she can just barely pay the house, but it's doable. She'll have $100 left over if maybe she can eat into some of those countable, those community spouse assets that she can get, that she can keep. So the $130,380, she can have assets of that value and she can liquidate them to support her if she needs as well. So let's move on to the next slide. How are we doing on time? Oh, good. Alrighty, so we talked about this already. So I don't know if I wanna go into too much detail because we already did the example. So this is when a gift causes ineligibility, very common. Having an adult child 
to the title in order to avoid probate. Most people come to me, they want, they've got two goals. They want to avoid probate, they want to make it easy for their family when they die, and they want to avoid a forced sale. They want to keep the house for themselves or their spouse while they're alive. So that's where you can see adding a child to the title satisfies the probate problem. Uh, if it's a joint tenancy or a life estate, because there's survivorship rights to it, but it causes another problem in the look back period. If it's beyond look back period, solves that forced sale problem because it's not even looked at. But it could be a forced sale problem. Well, it could be a, a yeah, the forced sale problem. They'd have to force the child to give it back to you, undo the undo the transfer or pay you for it. So you can see that the, the way that they figure out the value of a gift is they add up all the gifts during the look back and divide it by the average cost of a month of nursing home care, currently $8,781 per month. And that gets you the number of months of ineligibility. So for example, if somebody added somebody as a joint tenancy and that interest is $70,000, for example, on a house that's worth 140,000, uh, half of that would be $70,000 um, divided by the cost of nursing home care amounts to about 7.9 months of ineligibility. So that starts running forward from your medical, medical assistance application. So you're not going to be able to get medical assistance for eight months. So what do you do? If you need it, you can ask for a hardship waiver. That's not a guarantee, and you can appeal that if you get denied. But then again, if you do get it, they're going to pursue the child. And like I said, it's unclear if federal law would protect the child in our jurisdiction. Um, so getting a gift back can be pro problematic as well. For example, if you gave money, liquid assets away, they could be long gone. So problems can ensue. That's why... Um, you can appeal things and look for any exceptions to the rules or special circumstances to make arguments in the appeal. Yeah, might be something in the chat box, let's see. To avoid probate, you can use a Todd, but it's still subject to look back. But is it still subject to look back? No asset transfer until after death. So, so a Todd is a transfer on death deed which is another way that people try to avoid probate. It's a way where you add a beneficiary to your house title, for example. So you, in this example, they could solve the probate problem by doing a Todd, adding the child as a beneficiary. This solves the gift problem because you haven't given anything to your child yet because as a beneficiary, that beneficiary doesn't own it. You can still change that beneficiary designation, you can still sell the house, even if there's a beneficiary on it. The beneficiary has no right to the sale proceeds while you're alive. So there's no problem for MA eligibility with the TARD. Um, uh, the problem is if you own the house and you can't live there, there's no protected person then, and you need medical assistance, that's where the forced sale can occur at that point. Um, so a Todd solved one problem, but it doesn't solve the protecting the house from a forced sale problem. Good question. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, this is just one slide uh, for what to expect while receiving medical assistance. You'll see it in a moment. Um, oh, hang on. I forgot a slide, I skipped one, sorry about that. So like I said, some gifts are not a problem. So these are exceptions to gifts. Um, if you, and some are just flat out, uh, not a gift at all. <laughs> Under the MA rules, you can transfer things between spouses back and forth with no problem with uh, medical assistance. You can transfer to blind or disabled children, uh, sometimes to an exception acceptable trust for a disabled person, <laughs> excuse me. 
Um, and this is just a, a note of who is a protected person. And the spouse, blind or disabled child, <clears throat> a sibling with an equity interest and has lived there for one year in the house, you could transfer the homestead to. You could also transfer the homestead to a caregiver child who's lived there for two years and a doctor verifies in writing that that caregiver child's care kept you out of the nursing home. So it has to be out of the nursing home, not out of an assisted living. So a lot of times people run into trouble with jumping the gun on doing a homestead transfer We're using the caregiver child exception um, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, um, maybe they don't, for example, uh, if you transfer it to the child and then go to an assisted living first rather than a nursing home, that's going to ruin ruin the exception because you have to be in an institution and the assisted living is not that. So you have to go directly from your home to a nursing home if you're going to be using the caregiver child exception. And then the caregiver child has to live there and continue to live there in order to get that exception. And the doctor has to verify in writing everything that you do on a daily basis to keep you out of a nursing home. So you have to think about all the activities of daily living that are done on a course of a day. And the doctor has to agree with that. So homestead transfers can be done. It's tricky. Please get advice before you do it. Um, next slide. All right. Here is just one slide about what happens when you're on medical assistance. We kind of talked about it a little bit already. Community spouse gets to keep all of their own income. Um, once the MA has started, the county is going to ask that the MA spouse transfer assets into the community spouse's name, which is a good thing to do anyway, because the community spouse can then control the assets during this time period, and they can um, use them for their own purposes. Uh, if there are any changes, you have to tell the county right away, and I mean right away, within, within 10 days of any changes, income changes, asset changes, if you win the lottery, if uh, you move, kind of tell the county in case that changes your benefits because you don't want to get an overpayment. Because then if there's an overpayment, you can appeal those, but oftentimes they'll try to collect from you. And then you have to do a recertification every year. I think there might be a question in the chat. Yep, is there any criteria to follow? for the physician letter for a caregiver child exception. Um, it's just the criteria would be that it would, the doctor has to say enough in the letter so that the county believes that the doctor is verifying that enough care kept, was given to keep you out of the nursing home. So it has to show that the person needed a high enough level of care, nursing home level of care, so think about what cares residents in a nursing home need. Those are the sorts of things that the doctor should be putting in there. And what the caregiver child should be documenting is to make it easier for the doctor to do that. Next slide, please. All right, so this is another, this is the end of the line. Uh, in more ways than run. So this is benefit recovery of medical assistance. How does the state get repaid for the benefits they paid out after the recipient dies? So this is something that people are, are calling us about oftentimes, and we can go to the next slide. Okay. So this is a very complicated area, and I just put one slide in here because I know we're not gonna cover everything. I just want the main points out here. And if people have questions, they can contact me. The main questions, one of the main questions that people call about is they're concerned about getting medical assistance because they don't want uh, either an MA lien on their house or an estate recovery in probate. And sometimes 
they don't have to worry because they're talking about the wrong type of medical assistance. This isn't, recovery isn't for the healthcare policy type of medical assistance. Remember or the X and the one that we're not talking about today. If all you got was healthcare insurance policy type of medical assistance, you don't have to worry about MA recovery. MA recovery is for um, long-term care services for when you get them at age 55 or older. So if you ever were in the nursing home and getting medical assistance, in your home getting medical assistance to pay for services in those settings and you're 55 or older, there's gonna be an MA claim. MA claims don't go away. There's no statute of limitations. So um, there's a possible probability, high probability that they're going to collect after death. So the way that they do it is two main ways. You can do probate to get any type of probate asset and medical assistance rules have expanded the definition of estate to include some non-probate assets. Um, for example, before the change, if you owned real estate as a life estate or a joint tenancy, um, when you die, your interest automatically goes away by common law. But the law changed to say that the estate includes that um, interest that normally would go away. Um, so that's why they can put an MA lien on real estate interests. Um, some other, other traditionally non-probate assets will be up for grabs in probate as well. Um, also, medical assistance is a creditor and it's a creditor that has higher priority than other creditors. So they're gonna get paid before maybe some of the other estates creditors. So they can put a claim in in the probate court to get paid. Um, there is a MA estate recovery manual online that the Department of Human Services has that is actually not that bad. It's pretty readable and it does give a lot of information. Um, but let's talk about medical assistance liens because that's what a lot of folks are worried about. So like I said, as long as there's a protected person there, there's not going to be a medical assistance lien. Um, recovery is delayed until there's no protected person there or if uh, maybe the MA and the MA person dies. So nothing's gonna be, a lien's not gonna be on it until that happened, happens. However, they could put a notice of potential lien on there before death. And they have up to a year after your death to put an MA lien on it. So what happens is, is they put an MA lien on it and let's say it, without it, it goes normally to your child. Um, your child would contact the state recovery unit, figure out how much medical assistance was owed and what your interest was in the real estate at the time of death. And then um, how much they would be asking for is what your interest is, not necessarily amount, the amount of the claim. The lien is limited to what you own at the time of death. So then if the child wanted to keep the house, they would have to go get um, a loan to finance it. It's similar to like if you inherited a, a home with a mortgage on it, the mortgage doesn't go away, has to get paid. So this is somewhat like a mortgage, you have to pay it with getting a, a financing to pay. It. Sometimes people sell the house and then pay it from the proceeds. And I see some questions. Let's see, I want to be mindful of the time. We've got some good time. Okay. Um, question was, will the PowerPoint slides be sent? And Brenda followed up with, yep, you'll get those in the email. Um, going up is money in a supplemental needs trust under a five back, five year look back. If it's a proper supplemental needs trust, 
Oh gosh, I'm under pressure. I don't remember. They treat trusts with suspicion. You have to prove that it falls in the exception. If it's an exception, it's not going to matter that it's in the five year look back. Um, but um, if it's not one of those acceptable trusts, if you put it in, for example, uh, any type of uh, like a revocable trust or even an irrevocable trust, it's a gift to the trust because you gave it to that financial vehicle. Um, so that could be a gift problem. So we would need more information on the question. Feel free to contact me about that later. Let's see. And we have five minutes left. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a list of places to get further information if you don't want to necessarily come to somebody like me or an other elder law attorney. Uh, there's a lot of good information online, but sometimes you can get overwhelmed. So what I tried to do was put information that was pretty clear or places where you could get some, some um, information from an actual person. So there's the eligibility program manual, the EPM link up there. You could Google that and find it if you, if you don't want to wait for the, the handout. Um, similarly, the state recovery manual is online. It also has a pretty good description of what how probate works. So I encourage you to look at that if you have any questions about probate, even if you don't have medical assistance state recovery questions. Um, the Department of Human Services has some good informational pages about elderly waiver and long-term care medical assistance. Disability Hub is, um, you can think of it as Disability 101. So they talk about medical assistance, but they talk about all the other type of healthcare programs as well. And they have calculators on there. It's a very good site. Um, senior Linkage Line, I would be remiss if I wouldn't talk about Senior Linkage Line. If you have any questions whatsoever about health care policies, insurance policies, Medicare especially, contact Senior Linkage Line. Senior Linkage Line are the certified people that uh, know about Medicare, and they have all the people that are good to talk to on speed down. They can do three-way calls with clients to figure out Medicare problems. So oftentimes if people come to us with a Medicare problem, I would send them first to senior linkage line because they can fix it faster than we can and then come back to us if they, if they absolutely couldn't get fixed with senior linkage line, but they're awesome over there. Um, of course, there's legal aid service in Northeastern Minnesota. I'm biased, but any legal aid is, is super good to go to. You should have one in your service area, even if you don't live in Northeastern Minnesota. The whole state is covered by uh, areas of aging. Each of those areas has a legal aid that has a senior law project that will be able to give you some advice um, and possibly some representation about these types of matters. So please contact them if you've got any questions. Law Help Min Guide is another way to find out where the possible legal aid programs are, but they also have some nifty fact sheets about all sorts of situations, not only medical assistance, but um, healthcare directives, power of attorneys, um, housing issues, all sorts of things that you could think about in civil law matters. So please check them out. And all of those things are free. They also have a feature where some legal documents have, a, they ask you questions and then your answers are then used to fill out the actual form, which you then can print off, totally private. Nobody sees it on the other end. You can save it when you're ready to print it. Excellent. You can also go to the Minnesota court website and do similar things with some documents, but also get documents about all sorts of different areas as well. And we can go to the next slide. So we're coming down to one minute. And I want to say thanks to Brenda for helping with this series and for 
per organization, which is one of the area agencies that I talked about, one of the seven Arrowhead area, um, and Minnesota Board of Aging, Minnesota Live at Well, Live Well at Home funding, all helps fund these sorts of things. So thank you for those funds. And I use this template for slides and want to give credit to Slides Carnival. And we can go to the final slide. Thank you very much. If there's any questions that we haven't covered, and I'm sure there, there is, please feel free to contact me. There's my email, my direct number, and there's our website. So if you think that you want to do an intake or go do an intake, you go to the website, you can do one online. Or you could go to the, sec the second slide that I had that had the intake number, the 800 number. You can call that number and do an intake. So just briefly, when you call and do an intake, uh, what they do is they'll take an application and then they'll make a file. It goes to hotline. So we have a hotline feature where all the att staff attorneys take a hotline shift and a lot of paralegals do as well. So our goal is to give people legal advice the same day that they call or a very soon after the same day if we can't get to them as a way for you to know where you stand. And then the hotline attorney, if it's something that might be handled for further follow-up, they'll refer it to the relevant staff attorneys in our organization for, for more help. If it's something that we don't do or if there's a conflict, intake staff will refer you to our private attorney involvement side of things. So legal aid is divided into our staff side where we help folks directly, and then the private attorney involvement side where uh, we connect people with volunteer, volunteer attorneys to represent people and advise people on those things that we can. So I wanna thank you all very much. I see, oh, oh great, thank you, Mary. There's a hotline number and alternative care waiver. So alternative care is a different type of healthcare program covered under uh, the Minnesota healthcare programs. It's a strictly state program as strictly its own, own um, rules. And the human services has a good website about that, but Disability Hub is a good place to get some basics on that as well. Thank you very much for all your questions and for sticking in with me on this wonderfully warm day. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Kristen, so much for being with us today and giving us a really good foundation and for always being there when we've got more questions and we need some additional help um, being available. Um, just a reminder, um, we will have, I will send out a, a, an email with a link to the recording of today's session if you wanna review it or if you want to share it with others um, colleagues, uh, friends, and family, and such. Um, our next session is going to be coming up in April, and it's going to be on dementia conversation. So I will include information about that as well in the email. And if you do want a copy of the slides from today's presentation, there'll be instructions in that email for obtaining those as well. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to see a uh, survey when you close out um, today's session. Um, please take a moment and just give us some feedback on today's session or suggestions for future sessions. Um, where we'll, be, we'll be looking for, for new topics as we go into, those, um, into this, the later spring and summer and fall. And so um, we love hearing from folks as to what they want to learn about. And it gives me a great excuse to go out and find amazing presenters to bring those, those topics to life for us. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Brenda.